Welcome to a well-designed business with your host, Luan Nigara. Luan has a lifetime of experience building a multi-million dollar business with her husband and cousin, and she knows the challenges you face in your interior design business. Luan brings you real-life answers to your most pressing problems, as well as practical strategies to explode your interior design business. So, let's get to the business of interior design. Hi, welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. Hailey Ann Krasnow is with me today. Hailey Ann is one of the original founders of the Developers Group, which is now m s located in Brooklyn, New York. She oversaw the design of all of the Developers Group's buildings and sales offices. And then later, she opened the Design High, the exclusive interior design arm at m s In addition to commercial interiors, the Design High also does do residential projects. However, today, Hailey Ann and I are going to focus on the commercial side of her business. We talk about the very real differences and the skill sets necessary to achieve success in this end of the industry. I know that I say this all the time to you guys, but I really think you're going to like this show. (laughs) So sit tight while I tell you about our sponsor, Cherish, and then I'll be right back to introduce you to Hailey Ann Krasnow. I'd like to thank my sponsor, Cherish, and to let you know about this gem of a resource. Cherish, which can be found at www.chairish.com slash trade, is the premier online marketplace where design pros just like you can go to source the best vintage decor and furniture. With more than 125,000 curated items for sale, Cherish makes it easy, fun, and fast for you to find stylish pieces at great deals to suit every client and every project. The items are ready to ship, hint, hint, which means no waiting, and Cherish offers a two-day return policy. Here's some more good stuff. Cherish trade members enjoy special benefits, including cash back on every purchase, white glove delivery, and exclusive concierge service. Sign up for their trade program today at www.cherish.com slash trade. Hi, hi, Leanne. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. So uh, what's interesting is that I have had in the last month or so, more than a few listeners reach out to me and ask me to find some conversations about commercial interior design. And there you are over there in Brooklyn, and you are quite a powerhouse uh, lady there. (laughs) Thank you. Yes. I just am like, the more I read about you, the more I was just like, my goodness. So here's the thing. I set up in the introduction a little bit, some of your background and what's going on. But um, I think what we need to do is fill in some details now. (laughs) So... (laughs) So you start out in real estate and you start out working with uh, and beginning, a par- you were a partner in a development group, a real estate development group, and it morphs. Tell us a little bit about that, if you wouldn't mind, please, so we have some context here. Sure. So in 2003, I started a brokerage company called the Developers Group that focused on new re- residential new development in Brooklyn, in the five boroughs, um, specializing in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens. And from that experience, my job or my role within, within that partnership and within that brokerage was to help developers do all the pre-development planning. So designing unit mix layouts and then doing all of the um, – associate kind of interior design work, but with other interior design firms. So we would help consult on the interior design for the project to ensure that we were building the right thing for the target demographic that would get us the highest and best use at the end. Okay. And so, so you, you, this is where you, you spend several years and, Correct. and then that company merges with another company and becomes MNS Real Estate. Correct. In 2009, we merged with the Real Estate Group of New York and we became MNS. And I, my role there was still pretty much the same where we were working with developers on pre-development planning for their projects. However, at that point, because I'd already worked with some developers for almost 10 years, they started hiring me to do the interior design instead of me consulting on other interior designers. It was at at that point I was starting to basically just tell interior designers what to do. So I started getting hired for those jobs. So in 2011, 
I believe we felt the need to start a new company in conjunction with MNS called the Design High. Uh, and right now we have uh, four interior designers and an assistant, and we're a full, full-fledged interior design firm. Okay. And because, you know, you just needed something to do in your part-time is actually Correct, to, yeah. to take on I other projects. I love full-time jobs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it would be one thing if the Design High simply was the design uh, support, you know, whatever outreach or what else, you know, support like of M and S, but design high also takes on its own projects outside of the brokerage firm and the development company. Right. Correct. <laughs> Actually, it would probably be a 50, 50 mix. So 50% of our jobs are for developers that are utilizing M and S as a brokerage. The other 50% are for developers who are not using M and S that either have their own in-house brokerage or are so large that they don't need um, another brokerage company. And we're doing those jobs as well. Okay. Now it just occurred to me that at first I was like, really? Cause you need to have an, a part-time job, but it just hit yeah. me that maybe from a business standpoint, was it, Something so that, in other words, in order to support the projects that were your own at m and you needed a staff and a design team. And then maybe is it, was it the idea to open it up because, well, we can't necessarily keep them completely busy and afford them full-time, in-house, year-round, unless we sort of branch out and bring on other projects. All of a sudden, that sort of made sense to me. Is that where it was or it just, no? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the it, we started getting very busy doing our own jobs, but just from a business perspective, you know, that's a very shallow net to cast when mm. you're just doing the exclusive work on the projects that you have. You can, you know, from a business business perspective, when you can cast a wider net and get more jobs, it, it, it's more income coming in and, and it allows me to have a larger staff and, um, right makes it significantly more profitable. Yes. Yeah. I could see it. At first I was really like, why would you do that? And then as I, you were <laughs> talking, I was like, oh, right. Keep everybody busy. Not all the yeah. eggs in one basket. <laughs> okay, cool. I love it. So, okay. So now let's get into this concept of interior design for these commercial spaces because like I said I've got some requests for this and uh, I know Kimberly who works for me the interior designer that works for me she has said to me often that it when she was in interior design school when she was in college she fully believed that she would go into the field of interior design that specializes in model homes and you know residential lobby spaces and amenity areas like that now fortunately for me i found her and snagged her and pulled her <laughs> away from that crazy life um <laughs> but talk to me a little bit about it because we do have interest out here and it is a different it is a different design, right? You have to have some, you're not designing for one person, you're designing for the demographic that's going, that the, the, the property is targeted at, correct? Correct. So it's a completely, so there's a couple, you know, things. Um, one, you know, every neighborhood has a specific demographic price point and, and things of that that kind of help you, help steer you into the right design direction just from a pure design standpoint. Um, you know kind of what the look and feel wants to be for that neighborhood, for that building, for the context of the building based on what the architect is providing with the facade and everything else. However, um, the other thing that makes it a little bit more challenging from our perspective is we have budgets that we have to hit. You know, when you're buying um, for large scale projects, you know, you don't have the you don't have usually large budgets. Um, you have to stay within certain price points. So it, it, it makes it challenging to do a high end looking, high end looking finishes and still hit the price points that you have to hit with materials that can be sourced, um, readily available and can be in stock for large, large, large quantities. Right. And where do you start to learn and navigate those intricacies? I mean, I don't imagine from what I've learned in all these months on the podcast that, as terrific as an interior design education is, that um, what I've learned is that most times the curriculum doesn't really allow for such a deep level of instruction. So even if there isn't a semester or whatever, a course in commercial design, it's probably not going to be that intricate. Where do you learn that? You learn it on the job, obviously, but how do you learn it, highly Ann, on the job? So I think for the 10 years that I wasn't doing interior design, that I was just doing pre-development planning, you know, I've worked with a lot of great contractors. And honestly, that's where you're going to get the best information um, because they know, you know, 
They know what is going to be durable. They know what is going to last. You know, that's the other thing that we have to take into account, durability. These things have to last, especially in a rental building, for multiple years and multiple turns. They have to look aesthetically great for 10 years, but they also have to, um, at, you know, they have to be durable materials that will last that long. So you kind of learn a lot of that just from working on the job, working with contractors, seeing how materials last over a couple of turns within the jobs that you've worked on. Um, and then knowing, you know, which manufacturers, you know, are reliable that source that, you know, can work with you that can respond with, yes, I can offer you 500,000 square feet of flooring. And I can get it to you within six months. You know, you kind of learn who those players are and you cultivate relationships. Mm -hmm. And I think relationships are, are key to this. Yeah, because that is a very specific thing. I mean, we've worked at Window Works. We've worked for more than 25 years with a company called Roseland Property. They've now been acquired by Matt Cali. And we've had the account for the amenity areas and the leasing offices, the fitness centers, the lobbies for many years. And the rest of the building, the and we also do the model homes, uh, the model apartments for, for window treatments, all of this is. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the buildings, the comp, the hallways and you know everything, the design of the individual apartment has always been farmed out to a big firm like Charles, uh, Charles Dreyfus, is it? Or Childs, what is it? Charles Dreyfus in, in, in Chicago or Childs Dreyfus? I don't know. I can't keep them all straight. <laughs> or BG <laughs> Studios in Manhattan is one of them. But the thing is that you, we are, even with, say, the amenity areas for the lobby we or the, the fitness center, I might need to specify – I don't know, 150, 200 yards of fabric. And it's always part of our equation. It's like, I'm not going to be able to take a final measurement until say August 1st, but they're planning an opening November 1st. And I've got to be able to get 150 yards of fabric in and delivered into my workroom and made into draperies in a minute and a half. So you guys are specifying, you know, 10,000 units of granite countertops and everything else. So, and you want them all to be the same. So that's a really insane challenge, right? Yeah, it's a lot of, I mean, that's just for the interior. So, you know, not only are we specifying everything from, you know, a door saddle to the hinges to yeah. all the door hardware for every single unit, which, you know, granted, they're all the same. So there's, you know, limited number of kitchen types and bathroom types. And, you know, we can usually get them down even for a 510 unit building to about 12 different kitchen types and maybe eight different bathroom types. So we, we, we try to consolidate it, you know, a, a, and get it so it's a, a, a working thing. But on top of that, we usually are also responsible for all the corridor finishes, the lobby finishes. Um, all of the amenity finishes. And then on top of the finishes, we're also usually responsible for the entire FF&E package for those spaces and the model units. So we order, I mean, we just have one person who does purchase orders all day because half of our job is literally just buying things. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> We're just purchasing furniture constantly. I think we did 16 models last week and it's just an insane amount of of actual purchasing on top of all the intricate design work that we do. Right. And so when you go to, well, so, the, so yeah, so the models, okay. So, right. You don't need to buy furniture for 500 units. You need to buy furniture for the number of models that you're going to have in a space and the lobbies. So if you, you, one of your employees goes out to source something, if it's not going to be available in the timeline, you move on to a different selection. Okay. So now, Talk to me a little bit. Or we bit. have, we do a lot of custom. For amenities, we do a lot of custom pieces. Okay. Yes, built in. I can see. I, I can yeah, picture we that as well in the projects we've been on. So, so I guess what I'm hearing is that there is probably a huge curve if you're going to start your own commercial firm into learning and gathering and knowing these resources. But a firm like yours has them well established and you have your relationships well established. So let's talk about the interior designer who's listening that would like a position at a firm like yours. So for a minute, let's leave aside somebody who thinks they're going to start their own firm because I think that it seems like to me, logically, you would almost have to start by working for somebody just so that you can learn these resources and so forth. But whether that's true or not true, we'll leave it aside. So Hi, Ann, talk to us about the interior designer that's out there that is attracted to the commercial industry and in a high-paced, 
high stakes environment like your firm is, because I know from working with just the window treatments in this end, when there's a ribbon cutting, things are going to be done. You can't miss the ribbon cutting, yes. <laughs> right? So I think I, I've had projects that have stood still, stood still, stood still, stood still for six, eight, 10 months. And then all of a sudden it's six weeks, like, oh, we're on target. And you're like, what? Now yeah. you're on target? Yeah. No, everything's <laughs> always needed two weeks. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, so talk to me about you've got a staff of your on on the design on the design hive, and you have yourself and three others. I saw on your website, right? Is that correct information still? Yes, we have three interior designers, um, one administrator, and one intern. Okay, okay. So, so talk to us about what you would counsel somebody who's listening who says I'd love to work for a firm like that what what kind of skill sets do you want them to make sure that they've learned what kinds of things are you looking for when you hire this designer and open the eyes a little bit about what the day-to-day is like as compared to residential because I know we didn't talk about it yet but your firm the design high does do residential so just straighten us out a little bit about this pull the curtain back for us sure so I guess the first thing I'll just say is I'll the difference between doing interior design for a specific end user, someone's home or something of that nature is, you know, you can agonize over a lamp, let's say, you know, what the right lamp for that living room is. And that can be, a, you know, a lengthy conversation. You have a lot of time to kind of delve into the person whose home it is, what their tastes are. And and there's, I think, more time to kind of finesse the, the details. We don't have time ever, and we never have one specific client. We're always designing for a mass group. A thousand people are going to move into this building, and it has to appeal to all a thousand. Um, so we don't have time to, you know, uh, really just, you know, finesse each specific item. Um, it, it, everything you have to be willing to let go of certain things. You know, I might like a certain lamp fixture, but it might just not be, you know, that is going to be put in every single unit for the kitchen. However, it might get value engineered down the line. So the developer might eventually say, you know what, it's just, it's too expensive. We can't do it. You have to find me a new fixture. So you have to be very willing to let go parts of your design and be able to always have a, a, a fluid moving target. Um, so that's the first thing that I think that you, you can't be too married to what your design intent is because things always change and value engineering always changes and you have to be able to roll with the punches. As far as starting in the business, you know, there's a a great place to start would be firms that specialize in this or architecture firms that have interior design arms that specialize in commercial properties because you'll start learning the nuances of it. Um, And working for architects who do it, you'll definitely learn the nuances of uh, of doing large scale jobs and understanding what the budget constraints are um, and learning how to design backwards from those. Okay. Okay. So those are really two good points. And I, the first point, especially I understand because there's a fine line between being faced with something that can't happen and either a being too attached to it, like you described and not being able to move forward or B just getting to a point after that happens to you 20 times, 20 projects in a row or 20 times in a project of being like, whatever, you know, you still have to maintain your integrity and find the design through 16 choices or options that you had to walk away from that. I I would think that that would be, you know, somewhat challenging because it could be sort of defeating. It's like, oh, we can't have this lamp. We can't have this rug. We can't have this. Okay. Like you, you got to come in, you know, and, and still be happy and figure out a way to the end of the project. Right. Yeah. We, you know, so we've learned, you know, for instance, we're doing this, uh, a conversion in, um, in Queens and, you know, it's, it's a very large building. I think it's over 300 units and it hasn't been updated in a long time. And, you know, we did this kind of amenity quarter design leading to our amenities areas and, you know, we knew going in, we kind of proposed our wish list for what we wanted to look like. And we knew that it was probably going to be too expensive. However, we wanted to propose it. So we proposed it. And the first thing they said, it's too expensive. You know, we have to redo the design. But we knew going in that that was probably going to happen. So we said, no problem. We'll take off this one expensive layer, which was a ceiling detail. And the rest still stands alone. You know, we tried, you know, we'll always try to push it to get what we want. But we know we know never to do a design that we can't peel a couple of things off and it still work. You know, we never want to 
spend time doing design twice. So we always kind of go in with our wish list, but if you peel a couple things away, it'll still stand alone and work well. And that also sounds like a particular skill set, right? Because you yes. can't yeah, you can't just take one thing away and now the whole thing falls apart. But Correct. what you're describing is in order to be cost effective for yourself as an interior designer, you have to be able to peel one, two, three things away and not have the whole design stand there and go there where's the cohesiveness of it? Correct. Correct. Okay. And so and you learned that by working with more more seasoned interior designers. Yeah, working with more serious, you know, watching the process for so many years, um, you know, kind of from the outside and seeing interior designers do it right or seeing mistakes they made and just figuring out how to do this very efficiently. Um, The one thing with our design firm is we're extremely efficient with time. Um, You know, a lot of designers will take a lot of time to to do an interior design package and, and we can do it very efficiently. We know what we have it kind of down to a science. We know what works. We know what doesn't, we know what's durable. Um, and, and we can just kind of work through those details very quickly. And I think that's something, and we can, you know, we're chameleons, you know, we'll roll with the punches, you know, we expect a developer to say, you know what, we have to change this. And, and, and we, we know how to make those changes pretty effectively, but so, you have to be able to be a chameleon. So, so what is it? What, what, what is the, is there a juice that you get that's different from doing this because of the fast pace or because of the grand scale or because of the, the seeing the project of this level come to fruition? Because there seems to be a lot of action, a lot of detail. I know there's a lot of money at stake, but there also seems to be a lot of constraints. And so as a creative interior designer, you could see how there has to be, what's your payoff? What, 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 what is for you personally? Why do you love it? Or do you, cause you do both. Do you love one more than another highly in or where are you at on it? So I think, you know, the design part I always really enjoyed. Um, probably it's much more interesting and it gets out any kind of artistic, um, uh, skill sets that I've had and it's able to is able to utilize those and I'm able to see a finished product that I can say that we did. So I actually really do love the interior design portion. It's probably my favorite part of my two different jobs. Okay. So I, I definitely like it. Um, the payoff is, you know, for us, it's, it's two payoffs and this is kind of what makes us unique. Um, most interior designers want the best looking product at the end in the world that I work in. However, because I'm also on the other side, the pre-development side, my goal is to get the highest revenue from my clients. Mm. So the payoff for me is when I can do a redesign of a job and all of a sudden they're getting 25% more revenue because of it. Okay. So it's they were once... able to raise the rates for the apartment or the whatever it is. Correct. Okay. So for me, it's to see the finished product like wow, that's great. It came out beautiful, but also to know that it also worked the way I wanted it to, where the developer is getting a 25% bump in rent. Okay. Okay. So I like that. That's interesting. Very interesting. So what happens now? What what do you, when you go to hire somebody highly and to work in your firm in the high, the high design high firm, do you look for them to have X amount of years um, experience like you described at an architecture firm with an des- interior design department or something similar? Or it does a firm like yours, it's a relatively small firm, especially in contrast to your portfolio and the projects that you're doing. So if I look at that portfolio, I could easily see a team of 10 <laughs> designers executing that. <laughs> so do, are, you, are you at a point in your business life where you can afford to take take a somebody with only one or two years experience or no experience and train or do they need to come to you you know hitting the ground running so actually I don't um that's interesting question um and it turns out that most of the designers that I have on staff actually didn't come with um, a tremendous amount of experience in this um specific arena of new development um interior design so I don't think actually any of them had that experience Hmm. um and it's not that I, I would love someone to come in with it, but it's not how I do my hiring. Um, you know, we do something kind of, I, I don't know if other, I don't know how other interior designers hire, but the way I hire is I will do interviews based on my short list of people um, that I like and I like their portfolios. We'll actually give them a design test. 
Okay. Um, so I will usually send out a, like, let's see, a lobby floor plan with the exterior rendering of the building and the location of the building and ask someone just to give me a mood board for how they see the lobby being completed. Um, just a mood board, no renderings, nothing like that, just to get some kind of uh, concept on their vision. Okay. And that's a test that I've done um, every time I've hired someone and it's given me some great designers because you can see from their mood board if they get it, if they have the similar design aesthetic as you do. Um, and yeah, that's how I've hired all three that are currently uh, full time with me and they're great. And then training them is, you know, you, you'd learn as you go. So right. I have no problem training. Um, I'd rather train someone than get someone who thinks, you know, they have their own, you know, I have no problem training. So. Right, right, right. It's, it's, it's difficult to break somebody of something of, of bad habits or bad skill sets that they've learned. So, um, so interesting on the mood board test. Have you, <laughs> have you, h- how often have you given somebody that test and just looked at the mood board and went, oh, good Lord, what are you doing with this thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, my two first hires, uh, Jennifer Hush and, and Brooke Hurtsek, who are, you know, they've been with me for a long time and I trust them and, and I trust them completely and, and they're fabulous. Um, they were not my first choices. So it was based on the mood boards that they got hired. Interesting. Interesting. That's very cool. I love that. So if somebody is listening and would love to be a part of a firm like this, they would they one of the things that they can do to supplement whatever they've been taught and whatever positions they might have is to really study beautifully designed buildings, you know, go in and out of lobbies and interiors that maybe have won awards. And because there are those awards every year, I know from Roseland Property, there's the Mm -hmm. Commercial Property Awards every year, right? So study these trade magazines. And then in your area, whenever you have the opportunity, visit in person and really take a look and take into the way the lobbies and the amenity areas were designed and some of the ideas that were executed. Would you agree with that? Is that I I do. Okay. Okay, so I love actionable things that we can tell people to go out and do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, good for us. Okay. Now, I also know, Hylian, in that you are pretty committed to eco-friendly design and sustainable design to the point that you donate 5% of all your profits to the National Re- Resource Defense Council. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, we do. So we do a monthly donation. And then at the end of the year, we balance that out. So if it doesn't equal 5% of our monthlies, um, we'll contribute the balance of that to ensure that they're getting at least 5% of all of our profit. Um, But we do contribute monthly. Um, We also try to specify as many eco-friendly options as possible. Um, It is because it can be very impactful when you're building, you know, a 500 unit million square foot building, it can be very impactful to, to try to utilize those materials as much as possible. Um, it's easy in some areas. It's hard. It's hard. It's actually, it's, it's pretty challenging um, because a lot of places that have started utilizing, um, using recycled content, let's say for porcelain tiles and things of that, they're usually based out of the country. They're based in places like Italy, which have fantastic manufacturing plants um, for kitchens and for tiles that utilize all recycled material. There's hardly any emissions and waste. However, I kind of lose all of my eco-friendly propertiness of it by having to ship it all here. So, mm. you know, we're really trying to work with American manufacturers to start lines that, you know, utilize those same kind of technologies um, that I don't have to ship across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, also, you know, there's areas that are been much more challenging, like door hardware and things of that nature, and finding those made with recycled content instead of um, non-recycled content. And, and there's not many manufacturers to do that. So it, it's challenging, but it's something that we're focused on and that we try to um, bring to every project a, a level of consciousness. Do you find that, say, for instance, well, let me ask you first, did you sort of come to this outlook in the last year in the last five years have you always been like this when when where when did it start to become something that you actively source for your projects well it's something that's always been important to me just as a person it, it's an, it's an area of um you know we're, passion area I'm, for you yeah it's a passion area for me I, I have children you know we 
you know, my, my family's farm family from Vermont. So, you know, we're just very in tune to, to nature and, and land and, and maintaining that for future generations. So it's definitely something that's very important for me just on a personal level. Um, and, you know, before I, my role was limited to consulting only. So I wasn't able to push the agenda that far. Now that we're actually doing the specifications, we're able to push it even farther. Um, and there's so many options out there that it's actually nice to sometimes narrow your options by just looking at eco-friendly projects mm. pro- and products. So on that level, it kind of sometimes can make your job a little bit easier. Okay. Um, but then, unfortunately, we just have to, you know, developers look at the bottom line and there's costs associated. So if those items are more expensive, they get value engineered out. So, mm. you know, it's sometimes it can be um a little disheartening, but we just keep trying. Right. And are you finding, is there any new breed of developers and so forth out there that are willing to stand and say, I know it's more expensive. I mean, obviously they can't make it in every single selection in a building of these sizes, but you know, it's almost like when I think about Whole Foods, say, you know, Whole Foods compared to, I don't know, I don't know, stoop, stop and shop or whatever. Yeah. Like they, they, their company is founded on this consciousness. And so they're Therefore, if it doesn't align, they don't do it. Are you are you finding as the years go by that you have been, like you said, f- pushing forward this agenda that there are some developers and some contractors and some people that are willing to stand up and say, okay, yes, it's going to add this much to the budget, but this is important, or is it just too expensive and it's really only where it the same the the, the different choice is the same or less money. I think now, um, luckily, New York State has pretty high standards for energy, and they give for energy efficiency. So um, that's good, and it's pushing developers to to build properties better and more efficiently. And I think for the most part, as long as it does not cost them an exorbitant amount of money, most developers that I work with are more than willing to go that route. Because if anything, it's another marketing bullet point that they can use to differentiate their product from someone else's. So as long as you have an interior designer that has a knowledge base and and can spec specify those materials and it's not going to be more cost prohibitive um, for the developer they are most developers are definitely willing to go that route okay and you just mentioned something that I had forgotten but there's a building and I'm sure there's multiple but I'm aware of the building in Manhattan the Helena and I remember their whole thing is we're a green building and we've you know they actually as you describe market to the fact that they've gone out of their way to institute X amount of, you know, features that are specifically eco-friendly. And so therefore, if you happen to be a person like yourself, where it's important to you, and you're just looking for a place to live, if it's this building at 57 and 11, and that building at 58 and 12, and everything else is relatively similar, that's a great marketing feature. Yeah. And I, I, we've done lead buildings before and we've definitely done green buildings and it's exactly, it's another way to differentiate yourself. Okay. And yet, and, and also in there is a whole nother set of things that you have to learn as an interior designer. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is a whole nother thing. Okay. All right. So this is pretty amazing. Are there things that we could add to this discussion as far as when we're talking to the young designer listening who'd like to be in this field? Is there something else that you can think of? You mentioned that they need to, you know, not get overly anxious and overly involved and they can't get lost in the minutia of specifying the perfect lamp and getting attached to it. And you mentioned that it's a good thing to do is to start out working for an architecture firm, possibly that has an interior design uh, department so that they can learn the, the language and the codes and how to budget and how to work within budgets. And you mentioned that they should go and look and actively really stargaze at commercial properties that are well done. Are there other things that we can think of for them to give them tips to do, Hailey Ann? I, I think, um, you know, yeah, I mean, stargazing is great. Looking at hotels is great um, and getting a feel for how things and just understanding um, the most important thing and, and is really um, durability and just understanding how the design has to hold up for a decade. Okay. Um, and so it's, you know, really easy to get um, stuck in what the trendiest thing is today 
and design for today, but you have to design for something that is going to last the test of time. So, you know, sometimes you can't be as um, edgy. Edgy, yeah, trendy, yeah. edgy right. that that you want to be because you know this is something that that has to stand up for a long time. Right, I can I can relate to that with with the work we've done with Roseland Property. I feel like we've I would say they most I I, I have no idea what the timeline is, but based on my experience without going and looking it up, it seems like we probably are called in. We're redoing their models every seven to ten years. It's sort of like we'll get the call and we'll be like, oh, we're going back over to this property. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember we're doing that. Yeah, well, it's time to redo it. It's time to freshen up the model or trying to freshen up or what we've also done in, in in the past is changed business computer internet areas to yoga studios because yes. <laughs> you know when we might have first done it 15 years ago you know everybody didn't have just internet in their house and everything else and printers in their house exactly and now everybody wants a yoga studio on the property so and then the other thing i noticed the trend in a couple of the recent buildings that we've done over the last two years is that they have created common areas that have full on kitchens. And mm -hmm. so it used to be, you know, kitchen. Okay. If you're going to, you know, maybe you're going to reserve the common area for your child's birthday party or whatever it may be, there might be like a wet bar area with a refrigerator, but I'm thinking of one of the properties in DC called station house and right in the lobby, it's this big, beautiful off offset, but I mean, big, beautiful open air kitchen. And what they do is they have celebrity chefs or just chefs from the neighborhood come in from various restaurants and they'll have a, you know, a, a, a party for the residents and they'll all gather, but it's a really, it's cool. I'm like, I want to do this. <laughs> yeah, we do. We have, um, in lo most of our large buildings, we have, um, usually two areas. We have a lounge that has a kitchen area with TV and it's a, a big group area. And then we usually also have something called a party room yes. that also has a full kitchenette that people can rent out and have their private parties. Um, we do wine tastings, we do chef events. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it usually has a catering kitchen and things of that nature. So yes, we, we totally incorporate all of those yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. This, this particular building was different than many of the buildings that we had done over the years. It was really like when you come in, it really feels like you've walked into a luxurious hotel lobby bar restaurant. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, except it's empty unless an event's going on. You know what I mean? But, yeah. and then, I mean, and I do believe that they have a separate quote unquote party room because that's not an appropriate space to have your kid's first year birthday yeah. party. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but it's really very interesting and I love the way, so there are certain ideas that you embrace when you are doing commercial design like this and you look to the trends of, like you said, the neighborhood and the demographic because of course Station House is uh, very close to union station. I was thinking, what is a Union Square? It's Union Station in DC. So it's a very up and coming urban sort of an area and um, very uh, millennial area, right? <laughs> is the word I'm looking for. And so you have to cater to that. That's one of the other tips that you did mention that when you're thinking about the design for a space that you have to take in context, the neighborhood and what type of clientele and target market the developer wants to attract to that building and w what kind oh, of demographic yes yes yeah. yes 100 percent. okay cool no problem <laughs> <laughs> sometimes i get going down little roads there <laughs> <laughs> so so highly and tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you guys have personally done i was looking at uh your website and i saw the saxon hall project in rego park and it looks like there that you did the interior of the units you did the common hallways you did the elevators the lobby the facade of the building this this is a lot you've had a lot of projects is there something going on now that you're working on that you'd like to share with everybody yeah so probably my favorite pro you know we've done a lot of large-scale um, projects and repositioning you know we did Stuyvesant Town Peter Cooper Village which is I think the largest residential um, project in the country it's 11,000 over 11,000 units yeah. so we did the repositioning there that we're very proud of we are also currently working on an 800 unit rental um, in Wall Street that we're doing the all of the repositioning of the interior units as well as the common areas and about 25,000 square feet of amenities um, that were in that we're locating in an old banking hall so it's just got these amazing bones so we're pretty much wrapping up the entire design package there and we're very excited about it so that's a n whole nother level of 
criteria. So it's one thing when somebody is going to build something from the ground up and you're working with them to specify it, but you here's taking a building that's probably many, many years old if it's down on Wall Street, right? Yeah, it's over 100 years old. Yeah, yeah, I was figuring. <laughs> so, so that's a whole nother level because you not only have what you want to do to the space and the constraints of the architecture, but you've got guts of a building that's over 100 years old. And who knows when you open or move a wall what you find behind it. Yeah, it's been very challenging um, because, you know, the units themselves, we did those pretty easily. They came out fabulous um, and they look beautiful. The amenities, you know, we did a plan and then you know every once we start the demo and probes you know we find things that we can't move or you know so it's been a very we've had to modify the plan and the design numerous times to um to update for things that we found as we're starting to demo certain areas yeah you that's that's a level of ability and agility that is really can't be understated in that sort of design i would imagine Correct. Yeah. It's, it's been a challenge, a exciting challenge. And I'm loving what's happening, but it's a challenge. Right. And I would think that probably out of the gate, that's not the sort of a project a new firm would want to take on, right? You'd want to have your feet wet a little bit before you did something like that. Yes, that, that <laughs> is. <laughs> and this is with the developer we've worked with in the past. So we have a great working relationship with their entire team, which helps. Yes. And, and, and speaking of that, I, it, the, every designer's relationship with their vendors is critical. I don't care if it's a solo designer that's doing a bathroom remodel with a single plumber that's capable of the electrical, the plumbing, and the tiling, okay? Because I certainly know people, you know, that are that talented and can do all of that. But so critical at this level that you have a good working relationship with these contractors and that the communication is there. I, it, do you have somebody that's just tasked weekly with maintaining that level of communication between all these different trades? So each project kind of has its own project manager. Well, not I guess project manager is not the right word. Each project has their own designer um, head designer. So for Wall Street, the designer on that job is uh, one of my designers, Laura. Mm -hmm. And so it's her job to, you know, we all spend a, uh, have a weekly meeting and we kind of review everything. However, you know, she's tasked with that job and making sure that all the vendors, all the POs go out, all the elevations go out. Okay. So you work on each project as a team, but one person is assigned as the point man to make sure that everything the team does gets executed. Correct. Interesting. Okay. That's, that's, that's a pretty, that's a pretty significant seat to be in. <laughs> okay. All righty. That's awesome. I don't know. Is there, I, this is, this is interesting information. I think that for the couple of listeners that have been looking for some conversation on commercial design, I hope this was helpful. Do you have anything else that you'd like to share with us or you can think of that maybe I didn't think to cover before we go, Hi, Leanne? Oh, great question. <laughs> so broad. <laughs> I know. I know. You know what it is? Because I'm not that versed in this area. I only know my relationship to it, to window treatments. And I'm really just trying to, in my mind, go, what else do we need to know about this? <laughs> you know, I think, you know, the only thing I can say for it is we really like um, cohesive projects. So, you know, it's really important when you're, you know, you're usually picking out like, let's say interior finishes for the units before you get to the amenities and everything else. Um, so it's very important to, even when you're starting at, you know, the base level of the units to think about the project and, as a whole and to make sure that that kind of design thread can be carried through the rest of the project. I love it. That's a really good idea. Then that's, you know what, see, that's exactly why I ask these questions because <laughs> that's so true. You don't want to walk into the lobby and the clubhouse and the different things and get one vibe and then walk behind an apartment door and get a completely different vibe. Correct. Exactly. And so what you're saying is you need to think about it in the beginning because when you start to specify for, like you said, 500,000 square feet of flooring for the hallways, it has to be connected to what's going to happen behind that door. And if it's not available, then maybe a decision is changing behind the door as well. Correct. Awesome. I love it. All righty. See that? You knew. <laughs> <laughs> what it is, is I know if I were more 
versed in commercial design, I could probably get more out of you because you have, you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, that's probably not important, right? <laughs> or probably, no, no, not at all. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just a use. Sometimes we forget what we actually know. Yes, know? that is true. <laughs> you take for granted what you know. So, but I do appreciate your spending your time with us. I mean, obviously you're insanely busy and you've got a lot going on and tell everybody the website and how they see your work and they can connect with you. I'm going to go out on a limb. I didn't ask you before this, but if there are younger designers listening that would mind emailing you a question or two about the field, would you field those emails? Or are you just like, Luann, I can't believe you just did that. You must edit that out. <laughs> no, I mean, that is fine. Um, I, I'm happy to help anyone. I, I, I love to try to pay it forward. Um, I will just say that, um, it I might get be a, a day or two of emails <laughs> in a day, and so there might not be the quickest responses, exactly. but I will try to get to them. No, I totally hit you with that, and I appreciate your sentiment of paying it forward. But I think everybody's aware that everyone's time is respectful, and if somebody is willing to pay it forward, that you kind of sit and wait on their timeline for that pay it forward. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so share with us your uh, website information so that we can see. And I have to tell everybody, please, to go and. And look at your website because the projects there are, you really do some beautiful work, Kylie, and you and your team. It really is something to be admired. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I kind of feel bad giving, our website is thedesignhigh.com. Uh, however, it's not the most up to date. So we are, it's one of those things that, you know, we're so busy that we never get a chance to actually update our website. So there's a lot of other projects that we will have to get on there. Um, and my email address is hsk at mns.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate the time you spent with us. And I, I really do hope it inspired some designer to put their toe in this commercial field. Thank you so much, Hailey Ann. Of course. No problem. Thank you. So I was right, wasn't I? Wasn't that a great show? I really thought Hailey Ann had some truly concrete advice on the skills you need to be in this fast-paced field. And I kind of thought if you were truly interested in going into commercial design, at least you have a bit of a roadmap now and a little look inside of what it's like and what to do and what you can expect. Thank you to Hailey Ann for that. Of course, I was scribbling like a nut as usual. So if you want your free PDF of the thing I learned from Hailey Ann, please go to www.windowworks-nj.com slash Hailey Ann. That's H-I-G-H-L-Y-A-N-N. And it comes to my attention that I literally have avid listeners that let me know that they're loyal, avid listeners uh, through different channels that aren't on our mailing list, which is a little silly because that's where all the news is about the podcast. So a big reminder, if you're not on our mailing list now, it's very easy. You don't even have to go all the way to the website and click and all that stuff. You can just go to your phone and text design biz to four, 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 nine, nine, nine. Okay. Our weekly newsletter comes out every Wednesday. It tells you all the information on the shows, on any information on our sponsors. And it also tells about the events we might be planning. Hint, hint. It's a tiny bit too early to really say any details because I'm recording this, of course, you know, weeks way ahead, but we are cooking up a little event here in New York City, and I'm very hopeful at this point that it will come off, and it'll probably be in mid to late May, and of course, you guys are all invited if you want to come. So please get on the mailing list, text design biz D-E-S-I-G-N-B-I-Z, to four, 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 nine, 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 design biz to four, 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 nine, nine, nine. Okay. So, uh, next week, look for the roundup. I'm starting my little design bloggers conference roundup, two of the very truly talented young women that earned awards at the design bloggers conference are on the show next week. And I had a great time getting to know them and interviewing them and hearing about their processes. And, um, 
pretty sure you're going to like them too. So that is it for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Please share the show with a designer bestie. Send them an email. Let them know about the show. You can share the show by Facebook or email right from iTunes. And if you're at iTunes, it would be really swell if you left a review. (laughs) Hint, hint, right? All righty, guys. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day. Thank you for joining me again today for another episode of A Well-Designed Business. This podcast is a production of Window Works in Livingston, New Jersey, your trade resource for custom window treatments and awnings. Learn more about Window Works at www.windowworks-nj.com. All of our music is original music by Room 2 Productions. Please contact us if you want to learn more about original music for your business or your events.